Lots of sobering data there. Um, we're going to move on now to um, some of the Food Foundation's work, um, which actually is the first step of the journey that Boyd presented for New Zealand of analysing the food policy environment in the UK. Um, and we've done a, a, an initial evidence paper on this, which we've put up online today for consultation, and Fiona will present that. Fiona's been working with the Food Foundation, Fiona Watson. Um, she comes from a background in the UN, working on the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, um, and has been doing quite a lot of policy analysis for us. So, Fiona, come and tell us about the f food EPI. Show me the button. Show me the arrow. Good evening. It's interesting coming after two men because their presentations are full of lots of uh, figures and words and mine's got lots of pictures in <laughs> or it says something about my intelligence, one or the other. Um, Lawrence is presenting, as Anna said, some pretty sobering data in terms of the UK. The UK really isn't doing very well on a lot of um, indicators to do with nutrition and the food system. So what can we do? to influence our government to improve conditions in the UK. One of the things we can do is to use the tools at our disposal, like the Food um, Epi tool, which stands for a Food Environment Policy Index tool, which Boyd talked about earlier, to try to um, influence the government. And there are three ways that the Epi, Food Epi tool could be particularly useful in the UK context. It could first of all be useful to help um, identify the critical gaps in policy and to prioritise which are the policies that need to be changing first. Secondly, it is, can be useful as a benchmarking tool to help compare where the UK is in relation to international standards of good practice. And thirdly, it can be useful to help measure progress, to measure what our government is actually doing and to call them to account. I'm going to talk in the next 10 minutes a little bit about the um, methods um, of the food epi and where we've got to, particularly in the UK. Then I want to talk about the real life experience of people living in the UK, just a few examples of what it means in reality and how that compares with other countries. And then lastly, to look to the future and what needs to be done next to uh, move the food epi uh, tool on in the UK. Boyd has already talked a little bit about the food environment. It is one particular part of the food system that relates most closely to, impinges most closely really on the consumer, on people. Um, it includes um, things like advertising, tax, uh, food retail, everything that affects our everyday life. And this is a very nice little infographic from the Food Foundation, which was done as part of the Force Fed report, which illustrates the food environment. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods of food um, epi. Uh, Boyd already mentioned that an international group called Informas are responsible for developing the methods and that it is first been the, the one country where it's been carried out and applied fully is in New Zealand, hence the Kiwi. Um, but other countries are now also applying the method, including, I don't know if you can guess from the animals, but I'll tell you, Thailand, Mexico, South Africa, and Fiji and Australia are also um, em embarking on the process of doing the food epi method. The Food Foundation is starting, and as Anna said, has done the first uh, phase of the um, method. So below... Um, is set out the eight sort of steps that are undertaken in order to get a baseline um, uh, of to understand where policies are and to prioritise um, which ones need to be particularly um, focused upon. Broadly, the first sort of phase is one of mapping all the policies and legislation which are relevant to the food environment. And that is all pulled together into an evidence paper, which is the one which is now up on the Food Foundation site. The second phase is to bring together a broad group of independent experts, not necessarily government experts, um, to uh, look at those 
uh, those policies and to identify where are the critical gaps and to collectively uh, prioritise where uh, action needs to be taken. Just missed one step out. So the evidence paper is validated by government officials so that the information is um, correct. And then the last stage, phase, is to feed that information back to the government to try to influence change. Lloyd uh, Boyd, sorry, already mentioned that there are uh, 13 domains. Um, seven of those are in relation to policies themselves, and they're set out here. He also showed them. And a further six are um, linked to the infrastructure. There's an added complexity in doing the work for the UK. One of the problems is that, well, not a problem, but one of the facts are that we are actually four nations. And legislation is um, slightly different in those four nations ever since um, devolution in 1999. A second um, area problem is that the EU, although EU law applies to all nations, it's not all enacted in quite the same way. And the third complexity is that local authorities have powers um, and they will uh, implement policies in their own way. So in short, it means that a person living in a particular borough in London may actually have quite a different experience of the food environment compared to another person living in a different borough, and that will be very different probably from somebody living in Scotland or Wales. For each domain, a good practice statement has been developed, and again, this is based on the New Zealand work. Um, here's an example of one for food uh, composition. And within the domains, there are a number of sub-goods practice statements, and that's just one example. So the information which is gathered about policies and legislation is ordered under each of these um, good practice statements um, to be measured against it. There isn't time to go through every or each domain for the UK environment. So I was just going to say something about the overall approach and then move on to spe specific examples. The overall approach of the current government is very much as Boyd has described for New Zealand. There is a uh, focus on individual choice as being important for healthy, uh, the healthy lifestyle choices, of voluntary control of companies, um, not mandating uh, companies to do things, and transferring the responsibility, particularly for public health, to local authorities. The result of this is, um, it seems, a, a somewhat incoherent system. I want to move on now Oh, it's the wrong one. To some particular examples of um, how we here in the UK experience the food system, food environment, compared to um, other countries. And a lot of thanks to the nourishing framework, and particularly Bryony, wherever she is, for providing the examples from the international perspective. So we have here three 10-year-old girls from different countries. And their exposure to advertising food is very different. Fatima in Iran sees no adverts at all on soft drinks um, advertised on TV. Minso in South Korea has restrictions on advertising some foods during uh, TV, uh, uh, children's TV. Katie, on the other hand, in the UK, although there's some restrictions on advertising HFSS food on t and drink on TV, actually it's only around children's programmes and therefore isn't very effective. Another example is labelling. Here again we have our Katie and Daniela and Victoria. Victoria in Australia, um, many of this, well not many, some of the states now have laws which means that you must display the calorie content of food pro products on menu boards. Um, Daniela in Ecuador, there's mandatory traffic lights on the labelling of pack packaged food, so you know exactly what's in it. But Katie in UK, no, there's volu still voluntary traffic lights labelling on the front of pack labels. On tax, um, Estera in Hungary, there's tax of varying rates which have been adopted for ready-to-eat um, meals. Um, foods. Crystal in Barbados, I'm not using Mexico because everybody uses that example, there's an excise tax just been introduced of 10% on sugary drinks. We wait to see 
what will happen um, very soon with the obesity strategy and if there will be a tax on sugary drinks. School food is perhaps a slightly better example for the UK. Um, in Denmark, fruit and veg daily for schools. Um, Seagrid in Estonia has restrictions on um, HFSS food served in schools. But Katie in UK is benefiting from new food school regulations um, in England, um, in all of uh, countries actually. There is a milk scheme, free school milk for under fives. There is fruit and veg for young children given out free. So that's a slightly better story. Another example I wanted to use, last example, is on governance. Um, and I'm using a typical example, which is Brazil, which is a nice whole, fantastic multi-sectoral coordination. There's been personal ownership and leadership from President Lula in um, pulling all the sectors together. There's strong participation from civil society and from the private sector in trying to uh, combat uh, malnutrition. England, on the other hand, as I said before, appears to be very incoherent. Here's a jigsaw bits pieces which don't appear to be fitting together. It goes across lots of different um, departments and independent bodies and doesn't make a, a very good whole. Okay, last slide. Um, just to move on to the next steps for food epi in the UK. As I mentioned, the evidence paper is now complete. It's uh, for, out for consultation. It's being validated by government um, officials. So the next stage would be to uh, bring together experts um, uh, who can look at those at the evidence paper and to identify the gaps and prioritize and rate where they see the priorities are. So in order to do this, the Fa Fa Food Foundation is looking for partners. We want to work with people and bring